Acton, Acton, welcome to We Have Ways of uh, Making You Talk with me, James Holland, and a special guest today. We've got Dr. John Trigonning, and John works in the Department of Infectious Disease at Imperial College London, um, and he's the author of a book called Infectious Pathogens and How We Fight Them. Um, and we are going to go into that, but really it, it's it's bacterial battleground, what we're talking about today, and, and, and how medicine changed in the Second World War, the advent of penicillin, the sort of things that, that happen when a bullet goes through a grubby bit, bit of battle dress, something like that. I mean, I, you know, it, it's... I suppose the point is, is that we always assume, don't we, that the vast majority of casualties in, in any war, uh, not least the Second World War, are down to fragments of mortars and bullets and shells and all the rest of it but actually an awful lot of casualties come from illness blood poisoning or sepsis i suppose you'd call it i mean i mean it's 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 a more complex picture than that isn't it yeah it is but it, it changed it the second world war was a kind of key uh tide change in that point so they've been talked to a kind of a, a disease era of warfare and then the trauma era of warfare so up to the up to the end of the First World War, many more people were dying of disease, either through just the living standards during the conflict. So living in trenches is pretty unpleasant. But then of the disease, like you say, once if a piece of metal covered in bacteria enters your body, that has pretty bad consequences for you. Well, I've got US figures. In the US figures, basically, you've got... Com if we look at the, um, the... The American Civil War is a really good example of this. The American Civil War... 220,000 people died of disease compared to 100,000 people dying of combat-related injuries. Whereas you flip to the Second World War and 220,000 people died of combat injuries and only 15,000 people died of the disease-associated injuries. So there was a massive shift in that period. And for the First World War was kind of equivalent. The, the numbers weren't as big, I guess, for the US deaths, but it was about equivalent 50,000 deaths compared to of disease compared to 30,000 from combat. So there was this big shift in the Second World War, and, and most of that is down to antibiotics. There are other reasons why fewer people died of uh, infections, and that is also to do with vaccines and anti-malaria, and then more broadly kind of treatments to, to reduce the mosquitoes and, 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 and that carry the malaria and dengue and all the other things that they carry with them. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I do know that, you know, 14th Army, which is out in Southeast Asia in Burma and uh, Northeast, in, uh, Northeast India, um, you know, there is one battlefield casualty for every thousand succumbing to disease in 1943. I mean, that is a staggering statistic, isn't it? Uh, but obviously, you know, in the jungle, you've got dengue fever, you've got typhus, typhoid, dysentery, malaria is obviously the biggie. Um, snake bites, you know, marauding elephants, I don't know, whatever. But I mean, you know, you, you can understand, I, I suppose if you one stops to think about it, you, you can understand it. So malaria, like the Philippines, they, they, uh, Milne Bay, which I think is an island in the Philippines, they had 4,000 cases of malaria and 1,000 soldiers. So they were, they were getting infected and reinfected and reinfected. Oh my God. And, and I think part of the sort of uh, effectiveness issue between the uh, US troops and the Japanese troops is that the Japanese weren't replacing the troops on the islands. So they were becoming degraded and degraded and degraded. The US troops would turn up and for the first three months they'd be quite fresh and they wouldn't have malaria. So there was a kind of a fighting force issue and then they'd get sick and have to roll out and kind of keep on replacing through. Yeah, and I think to a very large extent that that's the difference between the Western allies in Europe and, and those on the Eastern Front and, and those in Germany. I mean, one of my great heroes is a chap called Hedley Verity, and Hedley Verity was a great um, bowler for, for, for England and Yorkshire, um, joined up a couple of days after the outbreak, of, the day after the outbreak of war, um, having just taken six for 14 or something like that in the last first class game um, against Sussex um, down at Hove in the last first class match of um, the 1939 season joins up joins the first green hards um, ends up in um, ends up in Sicily where in his first major action um, on the night of the 19th 20th of July 1943 he gets hit by a, um, a, a fragment of a mortar round and he's not pulled off the battlefield by his own men. He's picked up by the enemy. And 10 days later, he's dead. And what actually kills him probably is a combination of sepsis and hemorrhaging, you know, an ulcer, ulceric 
hemorrhage because of the wound. And that is purely because they don't have penicillin, right? I mean, you know, had he had penicillin, it, chances are he'd have probably been all right. Uh, yes, I think the tight, I think he would have been... Not necessarily, but... Yeah, and I think he'd have been unlucky on both sides because penicillin wasn't widely there till 1944. So there were treatments, but they were kind of not as effective. So, And certainly the German side of things was... Uh, it was less good than, than than the ally side, and I think it, it feeds back into what you've been you you talk about a lot about the sort of the couple of things of like flesh not steel and also the kind yes. of the, but the idea of like the massive industrial complex powering the allies versus the piecemeal kind of craziness of of the of what was going on in Germany. So in Germany, they almost certainly had the expertise to to develop these things. They just because it was so fragmented, they they didn't have the in they had the sort of um, scientific brilliance, but they didn't have the industrial might that the Americans right. threw into the question to bring the penicillin. So, and that kind of cut plays out in the penicillin story. I mean, one of the things I do know is that is that by Normandy um, in obviously in the summer of nineteen forty four, one in four battlefield casualties, uh, American battle, battlefield casualties that's reaching hospital is getting put back into action. And that is unprecedented in warfare up to that point. And I know in sort of modern medicine is that if they're still alive by the time they get to hospital, they'll stay alive. Uh, but, but but by 1944 standards, that, that is pretty impressive. And I'm sure penicillin plays a huge part of that. But but just go back, you know, t- w- tell me the story about penicillin, because I always thought it was Alexander Fleming. So so it is. Um, there's, so there's a nice myth, actually. There's a, If we start with the myth of kind of 1943. So um, Churchill got seriously sick in 1943 in uh, yes. Tunisia when he was flying in Tunisia and and the kind of the, the myth of the story is that when he was a boy um he he saved him from drowning and his father paid for the man's son to go to medical school and that son was Alexander right. Fleming who then discovered penicillin that saved Churchill so that's the kind of the the sort of right. myth that was put about in 1943 but probably it's not true because it's not the drug that they actually use so they the um Churchill in 43 would have been saved by a sulfonamide, which was a German drug, and it was also called Prontosil. So what... Yes, and the, and the Americans call this sulfur, don't they? S-U-L-F-U-R. And, and it comes in a white powder, and whenever someone gets shot up, the medic comes along, rips open his shirt, and just pours this stuff all over. So, what, so it's, a, it's a yellow dot. It's actually a dye, and the the oh. the, the group that because um, it looks like it looks like talcum powder. Yeah, yeah. When they, whoever you see in the movies. So the group, the the kind of scientist developed it was a, a man called uh, Domach, uh, and he should have got the Nobel Prize for it, but he was anti-Nazi. So he and he yeah. he discovered it around the thirties, and the the Nazi government refused that he should get the the Nobel Prize for this. Um, there's other the, the the other ones. There's lots of really interesting things about Nobel prizes. So uh, James Frank and Max van Lau, who were also Nobel physicists, they right. they won the Nobel prize, but they were in Germany. And then they to stop them getting captured, they sent them to Denmark. And then in Den <laughs> in Denmark, Niels Bohr melted them down in nitric acid and hid their Nobel prizes on the shelf, so they didn't get captured. And then they got remade. No. Yeah. So then after the war, they purified the gold at, back out of the nitric acid, and and they turned it back into Nobel prizes for the for these two people. But they, no way. The whole thing got That's kind amazing. of What a story. So 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 Domach had developed this magic bullet. Uh, it was a their German word is Zauberkugel, which is one of their right. their nice kind of uh, compound words. Um, and yeah. and they they'd gone through all of these kind of compact. They basically they'd noticed that some dyes um, kill bacteria, and they went through all these chemical dye compounds. So it's a dye. It's a dye, as in D Y E. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's a yellow dye that you might put in clothes or paints or. or okay. So it was a family of these these yeah exactly of these um, paint dyes, and they they tested th- hundreds thousands of them, and they eventually found one that did work and did kill bacteria. So it was one of the first antibiotics. The problem was then everyone started using it for everything. And if you overuse antibiotics, they lose their they lose their value because yeah, because the bacteria become resistant to them. So uh, the American soldiers were taking them prophylactically to stop themselves getting STIs. So they were all basically <laughs> knocking back the sulfur drugs before they went out on the town, and that would then dampen down the effectiveness of the sulfur drugs. So so they were they did work. They were a bit. They were less effective than penicillin 
chemically they're kind of unstable. You had to keep them in an airtight bag, and they kind of broke down quite easily. So they, so there was a drug you could use against bacteria. It had been used on Churchill, but they needed different drugs, and this is where the kind of search for penicillin type drugs came into it. So, so just to go back to Solvavo. Uh, so, although these, it was a German scientist who first came up with this, and he was hounded out of out of Germany. Does that mean that the the Germans don't have a sulfur? No, no, that, powder so no. So they had treatment. No, they had the they had the sulfur as well. So a sulfur was made by Bayer, but it couldn't be patented because it was a it's a the the, the basically the com, the bit of the drug that kills the bacteria had right. already been patented for something else 20 years earlier <laughs> and was off patent. Yeah. So everyone could make these sulfur drugs. So the Germans had it, the the Allies had it. So, so everyone had access to it. It just wasn't as good a drug as penicillin. Okay, so so obviously hygiene on the battlefield is uh, is is of paramount importance, and yet obviously you know one of the problems with with trench warfare is is how do you get around that, and you get around that by not having people in the front line for very long. There's there's obvious other reasons for doing that because of morale and all the rest of it, but presumably the prime reason for putting someone in a front line trench for five days and then moving them back into a kind of reserve trench and then moving them out of the line is so that you can constantly kind of monitor that your cleanliness and personal hygiene as as much as anything else. And, and I think that would be, you know, feet as much as tight, you know, it'll be fungal infections and, and trench foot and all those. There's lots of kind of... But trench, trench foot is specifically a kind of, you get that when there's lots of mud and your feet get damp and they never get, get a chance to dry. But obviously, you know, there is this sort of image from the First World War that everyone's constantly in a kind of sea of Passchendaele, Passchendaele-esque mud. When obviously... You know, a large proportion of the time, it wasn't muddy at all. It was just dry. It was, you know, it's only when it rained. What was the one you were talking about the other day? The it was in Holland or Belgium with the polder where they flooded everything and they just yeah the, yes, the Canadians yes, yes, yes. that that sounded um, just abysmal and that would be yeah. you'd be infected all the time. I think. Would you? So you and and that is just the process of being damp. But there are other other diseases you can have from dry soil, or, or you know, just by. Not cleaning your socks enough. I, it has to get into your body. Your body's pretty good at, at stopping stuff getting into it. So it, right. it's mostly through wounds and broken skin. And so so maybe if there's abrasions and then breaks the skin, then the bacteria can get in. So say you get a bullet hole and the bullet goes through your dirty bit of, of surge battle dress or Denison smock or whatever, it, you know, Feld blueser, whatever it might be. The problem is, is your, your Denison smock is sweaty and grimy and might have lice on it or it might just have mud on it or could have any anything on it some sort of awful grime you've got the trauma of having a bullet going into your penetrating your body which is bad enough but then it's it's pushing unwanted bacteria into the wound which is then presumably multiplying worse because of the trauma that's already happened to your body because of the bullet? Or is it just because it's exposed to raw flesh? It, it would be, I think that probably the trauma would help the bacteria because it then, I, I think it's, you're quite compartmentalised normally. And, and it, so if the, certainly if it goes through, like, you know, when people get shot in the guts, it's always, the, the outcome is far worse because you're basically exploding a sack full of bacteria inside your body. And it can spill everything. That's where people oh, get... see. Uh, so that's why stomach wounds are so bad. Yeah, because you get you're basically increasing the amount of bacteria. You're su- it's not just what's carried on the bullet and the and the skin and and the the bit of cloth, but it's also this massive bag of the one billion bacteria inside you, all linking into your body. But I'd never really considered why it was that stomach wounds were so generally fatal in the Second World War. And that's why. I mean. You know, that's amazing. And that's what septicemia is. It's just a general bacterial infection of everywhere in your body. And and then... Oh, it's not just the blood? Uh, it starts in the blood and then it spreads into other compartments. Uh, and, th- yeah. and the problem then is your body's immune system just throws everything at it to try and kill all the bacteria and in so doing can also damage you. So there's just this escalation of everything happening at once. I asked you about, about 20 minutes ago about, <laughs> about Alexander Fleming. Yeah, so, <laughs> and then, then entirely my fault. We kind of got sidelined. So he was a medical microbiologist working at St Mary's Hospital in London. So that's uh, you know, coming to Paddington Station, and it's the hospital right in front of you. So he was working there, and the story goes he went away for a two week summer holiday, and he left some bacteria. So they, they knew about bacteria. He left some bacterial plates. With so plates are like the diameter of a mug, 
uh, about one centimetre deep. And these are sort of petri dishes, pe- aren't petri they? Petri dishes, right, exactly. So bacterial petri dishes, full of, um, which have uh, a kind of a nutrient jelly that bacteria can grow on them. And he'd left a load of them in his lab with the lids off um, accidentally when he went away on holiday. And he came back and he found that some of his bacteria on some of his plates had died. So he looked at the plates and some of the bacteria lived, some of them died. And the ones that had died had a yeast contamination on the plate. So something had blown. And the story is it blew from the Fountains Abbey pub, which is across the road, in through the window and landed on his plates. And this yeast was a thing called which they he called penicillium yeast and it produced a chemical compound called penicillin which killed the bacteria so he he identified the compound itself but it was in the early 1930s and didn't he didn't do much more in terms of how you make lots and lots of this compound but he did find the compound but 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 did he recognize that this was a game changer for kind of he did wounds and so on. But it then moved to other people. So it then moved to Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. So Ernst Chain was a German German Jew who left in the thirties and, and came over to work in Britain. And they were chemists, and they looked at methods to extract penicillin from the yeast. So how 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 do you go from getting it landing on your plate from the pub to being an industrial scale? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back shortly. See you in a moment. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. It is extraordinary, isn't it, how, how the Nazis shot themselves in the foot with with people who could do kind of nuclear fission through yeah, people who are doing pioneering work on 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 penicillin through to all these things that could have really, really helped their war effort had they not been Jewish. Yeah, and, and there's so and across the sort of infectious diseases history, there's so many uh emigre G- German Jews. So Flory and Chain they developed this um, process to extract it, but again, at quite low yields. They they had probably about enough in, in kind of about the 40s. I think one, uh, they did one treatment of a person to show it could work, but it ran out of drug and the guy unfortunately died because they ran out of drugs. So the idea existed, the chemical process existed, but it was inefficient, but... I mean, and then there's what's quite interesting is in, in the exchange of knowledge. So this is uh, 1940s, and you'd think that this is, a, like you say, a war-changing, top-secret thing, and they published it in the Lancet about how... So this is in a open journal, but because... Yeah, so anyone could see it, Russians, Germans, a whole lot. It, in theory, but you'd have to get the physical copy, I suppose, and you'd have to translate it, and, and quite a lot of the information didn't... the. There, there were like information didn't flow quite as freely, I suspect, but it was out there. But the Americans then, uh, well, th- through a connection at Yale, basically, Flory moved to meet a guy called Percy Wells, and he worked in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and he was all, he was based up in uh, well, they they were involved in Peoria, Illinois. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but. Uh, Illinois, Chicago has lots of grain and they, they use it for all sorts of things. But they, they had processes. Where you got grain, you got yeast, right? Yeah, and, and you can grow things. And they had industrial level um, processes for making um, citric acid out of the grain. So they had these these big fermenta- fermenters and tanks. And so they had the kind of industrial process. And he then, the, um, the Americans were then, right, well, let's look for ways that we can grow at, at scale using Florian Chain's method to, to purify it. But then there was one more step in it. So there was a a, a lady called um, Mary Hunt, whose job it was to go and hunt. Her, she went around all the fruit markets in Illinois looking for infected fruit or moldy fruit. And she kept, her nickname was Moldy Mary. And she found a, a, a strain of yeast that produced way, way more. It's like, a, you know, like you select for cows that produce more milk. She found the, the right yeast. And then from that yeast and the industrial process, they, they made, um, they worked with Pfizer in Brooklyn. And by 1944, they had a plant that had 14, 7,500 gallon tanks. And it was producing more penicillin in a month in March 44 than it did in the whole of 1943. 
so they had they just had this huge burst in time for D-Day so like basically every allied soldier at D-Day had some penicillin with them uh, and then there was that's amazing isn't it which is why you presume you get that that transformation of, of battlefield casualties so you've been wounded on the battlefield medics have come along they patched you up poured sulfur over you presumably put a field dressing over you put you on a on a stretcher strap you to a jeep and you're taken off to the kind of you know regimental aid post whether it's a medical officer or whatever so this is before you get back to the kind of field or hospital several miles behind the line and, and at that point if he gives everyone penicillin he's then got time to decide who needs the urgent surgery who can be who can be left whereas before in the first world war they everyone was just dying very very quickly and and were were or were were getting so sick so quickly they couldn't work out who to triage so your triage becomes more efficient and you can pick the high the highest risk patients first people aren't just going to immediately die of bacterial infection wow okay so that is a game changer and the germans never have this in the second world war do they one statistic i found reckoned that the germans had so 20 to 30 percent gangrene whereas the allies had 1.5 percent gangrene so it just completely the, wow so they, i mean that is such a difference yeah so they could just recycle their troops faster and, and back in because if it's mine you know or, or move people around quicker quick so after the after that that early petri dish stuff fleming sort of disappears from the story in a way i mean he's he's not he's the founder but he's not he's not the sort of developer that that's my understanding yeah so he, he was, and that's why the so the the nobel prize is split between him flory and chain so they they have equal share on the nobel prize when it is awarded right. it, it, whenever that was so yeah so he, he had the idea they had the kind of chemical nous and then this massive industrial complex was what was actually required to kind of drive it through in the speed it got driven through and what about malaria? Because malaria is such a massive one as well. I mean, you know, on the Sicily campaign in July, August 1943, for example, there were more casualties to malaria on all sides than there were battlefield casualties. And, and, and you know, and we already talked about that incredible statistic of, of 14th Army in Burma. Um, you know, one one battlefield casualty to every thousand to, to illness, most of which were malaria. And... In the Far East, they develop, you know, they, they, I think, is it mepocrine? Is that, is that, is that right? Yes. Something like a- that. Atabrine. So malaria is a, a really interesting story of like war and colonialism. So um, the first anti-malarial drug was a drug called qu- is quinine. It's the one in, yes. it's in your tonic, but in, in very, very small yeah. amounts now. It used, it, the reason it, it's a part of the reason for gin and tonic was that the soda water and the gin took away the taste of the amount of quinine you had to drink to stop yourself getting malaria back in kind of colonial India. But the quinine came from the bark of a Peruvian tree and the Dutch stole it and grew it in uh, the Dutch East Indies or Indonesia. So the main source, the global source of uh, quinine was Indonesia, which then got captured by the Japanese and also Holland, where all the um, factories were, got, got captured by the Germans. So the the Allied right. anti-malarial drug was completely cut God, off. That's fascinating. I had no idea. So quinine comes from a bark of a, of a tree, but it's not the quinine tree. Is it? It's the chinchona tree, uh, which was chinchona tree. which was okay. named after the the uh, I think it was like the colonial yeah. when emperor's wife. It, it, it was uh, yeah. So so it right. comes from a tree bark. Yeah. Um, there is an alternative, which again Bayer, the German uh, pharmaceutical company, came up with, which is called Atabrine, and right. the Allies discovered this when in Tunisia when Rommel's army retreated. So they captured stocks of the German Atabrine, and it was less effective than quinine, but it was somewhat effective. My grandfather fought in Burma. And when he came back, he was kind of bright yellow. He was skinny and bright yellow was what his mother said because he'd been taking this compound, which right. affects your liver and then gives you jaundice, but stops you getting malaria somewhat. I mean, he got malaria several times. but um, And so it turned your skin yellow. There's lots about Japanese misinformation, which put the American troops off having it. So, you know, so there was a kind of a sort of anti-malarial drug movement about it as well. But the Americans appointed a theatre malariologist uh, called Colonel Howard Smith, and the US were making two billion doses of this atabrine drug a year, and were just forcing the soldiers to take it in vast amounts, and and it was probably semi-effective. I think the other thing that they had was the chemical called DDT. So 
DDT is the yes. insecticide, which is very effective, but it is very long. The reason it's so effective is because it's very long lasting. But, uh, okay. but that's the reason why it's so bad as well. That's why it gets into the birds, because it, it, it hangs around in the bodies for so long. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. which is why they're killing all the birds of prey in this country. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I've got a photograph of, of an Italian woman and her child sat on the pavement of a street and Americans are coming up and sort of puffing them with DDT. And it's sort of all a bit humiliating. And, and it's just this sort of cloud of stuff spraying them with DDT. And, and, and they found it, the, the chemical could be around for ages, apparently. And it was, but it was not used as an insecticide till 1939. And the US military attaché had shipped some back from Switzerland. He'd found, he'd, he'd found it in somewhere in Switzerland, just shipped it back. And they said, use this. And they basically bombed, bombed the forest with it and, and did vast ecological damage, but probably reduced the amount of malaria. Germans did try and make but you know it was published they had access to the cultures they probably had access to the knowledge as well they just didn't invest the effort the time into to to making it and it was probably just a well i've i've, I've made the point so many times on the podcast that, that that it is just incredible how often the germans don't prioritize what they need to prioritize and do prioritize what they don't need to prioritize you know so they decide in summer of 1942 not to prioritize um, developing an atomic weapon, for example, um, and now you're saying that they, you know, they understand this, but they don't prior- prioritize it. I mean, it just seems absolutely insane. Yeah, and, and somebody's described the uh, penicillin project as probably as 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 ambitious as the Manhattan project. It was kind of a similar scale, and probably I guess it probably had a similar, you could argue, similar impact in terms of um, remaking the modern world. Certainly after. After the war, oh, absolutely. I mean, I just think it's absolutely extraordinary. And 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 you know what you're saying, the difference between German and and Allied Western Allied um, cases of gangrene is just that, that's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. And then the Russians had. I mean, that gives you such a huge advantage. I suppose that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. And the Russians had a similar program. They actually they were trying a slightly different antibacterial approach. So there's a there's a way you can use viruses to kill bacteria, and they sort of had it working. Um, they got it all going in the kind of early 30s and then um, all of their scientists got killed <laughs> in a similar kind of thing. It's it, it's all kind of the it, the stereotypes of that period of history writ large. You, they had the right people, they killed them all and therefore they fell back in, in kind of the de- development. Um, they, Isn't that extraordinary? And, and so they then did develop their own form of penicillin uh, based on a, based on a, a good uh, honest Soviet strain called penicillin crostotum, and they called it crostosin, but it was it probably wasn't as good, and they probably basically just stole a load of they they stole the secrets about how to make penicillin, and there there was an exchange program between so Flory, who was the scientist who developed in the in the UK, did go over to the USSR to help them develop the kind of penicillin story. So so there were kind of overlaps in kind of it, it sort of reflected sort of national characteristics at the time. It does seem, though, that the the Western Allies, because of this development, do have just an absolutely astonishing advantage. And obviously it's all going badly wrong for the Axis forces by 1944 and obviously into 1945. But that how much it's going wrong is also exacerbated by the lack of medicine on the German side, on the Axis side, and, and ultimately on the Japanese side as well. I mean, presumably Japanese medicine's pretty far behind as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't find anything about that, but I suspect the kind of general approach to their troops was meant that they just weren't interested in it, you know, if it's if they can't feed them. It's then, amazing, but... isn't it? Because it's so obvious. You'd have, thought, you'd have thought, I mean, one of the interesting things about, about the way we did rationing in, in the United Kingdom in the Second World War was everyone always thinks it's incredibly tough. Well, it sort of wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, rationing is is not about the f- so much about the f- the change in agricultural processes is about the fear of of not being able to feed the nation, which is why we go from produ- providing fourteen percent of the daily calorific rate in the UK in nineteen thirty nine, and we go to ninety one percent by nineteen forty five, and that's because most of our food. You know, really simple things like butter and obviously wheat and but but all sorts of stuff, bacon, all sorts of stuff is just coming from overseas. Or you know, a tap which either does get turned off or it becomes important to turn it off because you need that shipping space for other things, you know, guns, tanks, whatever it might be. Um and, and so there is a there is a practical reason for, for, for that agricultural revolution in the United Kingdom 
between 1939 and 1945. But rationing is, is separate from that. Rationing is not about a shortage of food. It's primarily about ensuring that everyone gets a balanced diet. Because if you get a balanced diet, then obviously you're going to be healthy. And if you're healthy, you're going to be better soldiers and better at producing tanks and factories. And it's just as simple as that. You have less work days of people off sick and, and all the rest of it. Whereas if you're German and most of your workforce is coming from slave labour um, and you're already short of food, you're obviously going to treat your slave labour worse than you are a German citizen. Psychologically, ideologically, it would just be impossible not to do that. So consequently, they're getting ill, so they're weaker, so they're less effective. Um, they're not strong enough to be able to do a lot of the manual labour jobs that they've got to do. So again, they're, they're, they're kind of just constant, they're just making their situation worse and worse and worse. Whereas a British situation, and obviously it applies to Canada and America, who don't have such, such food shortages anyway, you know, it's just getting better and better. And this also applies to medicine as well and, and general concepts of hygiene. So, you know, by even before Normandy, the moment, um, you know, a huge amount of play is put onto field hospitals and making sure that field hospitals have absolutely everything they need, you know, in terms of supplies, food, provisions, shipping, truck space, whatever they need, they get it. And the same with troops, you know, the moment you come out of the front line, you know, you might have been in a six day battle or something. The moment you come into a, you know, to a rest camp five miles, 10 miles behind the front lines, the mobile shower unit turns up. You know, the old uniform gets kicked into touch. New uniform comes out. And that is not not treating troops softly. That's about making sure they stay healthy. Right. That That's the primary. I mean, it's psychologically, obviously, as well, it's a morale issue. But, but presumably, first and foremost, it's about keeping people healthy. And if you're healthy, then you're better able to fight, produce tanks and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, but do you think it's part of the contract as well? You've, I've heard you speak about the contract as well and how that runs into the NHS after the war. You, the, there is the, maybe the, yeah. the contract. They, they will treat people better. And the rationing is remarkable because I think people were more healthy during rationing than they were till, you know, 30 years later. The point was to stop the rich hoarding. And, 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 you know, you're uh, and I've made this point before, but, but you know, if you're a, you know, from a tenement block in I don't know, Leeds or Bradford or something uh, and, and you, you know, you've been living four to a bed with your siblings and, and living off uh, um, bread and dripping. Suddenly you're in the army or, or suddenly you've got rationing. You're getting a much more balanced diet that includes vegetables and fruit and, you know, meat and carbohydrates and protein and all the rest of it in a way that you weren't before the war. So. Yeah, no, unquestionably, it's part of the contract, and uh, uh, you know, the, a huge amount of uh, importance is laid on on morale and, and how important that is. Uh, and absolutely, you're right; it is part of that contract and and the welfare state that emerges out of the Second World War and why Labour get in and Conservatives don't in 1945, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is also a hard, pragmatic point to this as well, which is keeping your workforce, whether they be frontline soldiers, whether they be truck drivers, or whether they be building shells and tanks as healthy as you possibly can. And that's obviously makes a huge amount of sense. So why wouldn't you spend a huge amount of your R&D or research and development into medicine? Um, and it seems that that is what's going on. And, you know, you're making that point that penicillin is being developed on a level with, with the, the Manhattan Project or the B29 or something. Um, but to me, that just makes perfect sense. And, you know, it's yet another reason why the Allies win and the Axis forces don't. And uh, But why... I mean, so the, I guess the Russians just had num just took numbers. They just went for numbers of people. But why did the Germans not do it? Was he so unstable in his politics? Like he felt so unstable that he didn't feel he could push into that war footing in a way that the democracies could, or or Hitler? Is it? Well, I think I think it's because the fundamental problem with the Nazi state is is that its foundations are extremely shaky. Uh, and everyone's fooled by the 1930s because suddenly there's jobs and there's autobahns and all the rest of it. But but the whole premise of the Nazi state is built is basically built on IOUs and and you know dodgy economics and and backhanders and you know false promises. And, and, and you know and Germany is just not economically ready to fight a war in 1939 at all. It hasn't given itself enough chance to to rebuild post the Great Depression and post the trauma of the First World War and Versailles and all the rest of it. So they're just doing everything just a little bit too quickly. Uh, you know, when you look at something like Japan, for example, you know, by 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 1944, something like 84 percent of their GDP is spent on defence. 
<laughs> that's to, you know you you, th- you think we're sort of balking at three percent in the UK today. I mean, eighty-four percent or whatever it is. I mean, it's well into the eighty. It might even be eighty-eight percent. I can't remember, but I mean, it is into the eighty percent, eighty into the eighties of percentage is spent on GDP. You know, that is a country that's going nowhere fast, and is and is the only reason they are able to keep going is because. They're totalitarian states. They're complete autocracies, and and you know people don't have a choice in the matter. And the you know in the case of both Nazi Germany and in the case of, of Imperial Japan, there's a sort of national brainwashing that's gone on, which enables them to devote themselves in Japan to the to the emperor, and and in Germany to the to the godlike figure of the Führer. Um, they're both equally mad, uh, and they're both only going to lead one way. But but. Ah, oh, gosh, Sean, I mean, it's just fascinating, all this. I mean, it, it's great to have it properly explained. And it's one of those things that most people just don't think about, I think, particularly in relation to the Second World War. So, yeah, amazing. No, thank you. Thank you. It's been, no, and, and it was kind of a small bit of what I'd been looking to anyhow. So I, I had a chance to kind of, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I, I rely loads on other people's research that they did to kind of look into this. I think, one of the things I found really fascinating is, uh, and this is more listening to you guys, is science and history are really similar. They just face different directions. Like history, you're when it was when you were saying that you couldn't, um, you didn't know the German tactic. You like people don't know the German tactics down to section level because there's no field manual. It's uh, just that level of detail. You're kind of piecing together, and like we're going forward and piecing problems together in a different. So it's really interesting. But I'm completely relying on historians for what I've done here. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, I mean, I suppose when I, I think about the Second World War, I think that you know people people who write about the Second World War always get called military historians. But I was kind of thinking, you know, actually, you know, from my point of view, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm writing about the, the the war, Second World War, in either in detail or, or in a in a sort of wide, broad broad perspective. But one needs to be an economist and a scientist and a medical student and a, a, a and a social historian and a political historian and and so many other things and it, and it's worth talking to people outside that you know who aren't just historians that they are medical scientists or scientists or physicists or say um, economists or, or whatever to give you that kind of broader spe- perspective. So it's absolutely fascinating to be able to talk to you. And to be able to get this different take on a really, really important part of warfare, and particularly applied to the Second World War, which most of us just don't consider. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, John, thanks very much. And for everyone who's listening, uh, cheerio and see you next time.